singularity. My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity One on One. If you enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in several ways. You can, uh, for example, go and leave a comment on YouTube. You can leave a review on iTunes, or you can simply make a donation. And uh, as always, I will be the man with the questions. And today, the woman with the answers, my guest of the show, would be Liz Parrish. Liz Parrish is a founder and a CEO of BioViva, a company that aims to change the paradigm of aging and disease. Also, as it turns out, Liz is a fellow podcaster, as well as the host of the BioTrove podcast, which is a podcast about the future of biotechnology and medical science. So hi, Liz. I'm so excited to have you on my show. Hi, I'm excited to be here, too. A couple of podcasters getting together. Can't be anything worse than that. <laughs> Fantastic. However, you're one of those podcasters who actually uh, walks the walk. And, and who goes to make real change in the world, not only through their podcast, if there's any such thing, uh, but through the other actions and work that you do. So if I were to ask you to introduce yourself in a couple of words, how would you do that best? Oh, geez, I don't know. I, uh, in a couple of words, oh, you really put me on the spot. Uh, change oriented, <laughs> uh, educator, innovator, maybe that's it. I think that the, as far as the podcasts go, uh, this is, this is really important work. Uh, media is very important. Uh, this is how we get big ideas out to the general population. You know, we don't want to just speak to the choir, uh, even though that's a fantastic thing to do. It's always great to have backing. We need to get a lot of information out to a lot of people. Um, then on the other side of the, the getting things done, um, that is uh, integral. Uh, I think that that is where I hold probably the biggest power there is to make a uh, major change. Uh, so we have to make change, but we have to get information out while we do it so that people can accept that change. Uh, if people don't know what, in my case, what gene therapy is, uh, what gene editing is in the future, uh, if they're afraid of it, uh, it will definitely hinder everything that I do. So all of this is really important, and it plays a, an important role in big change. Both of them work together. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and let me ask you this then. What is the major goal of your work? What's the best case scenario? What's the dream? What's the thing that makes you get up early in the morning and say, I'm going for it? <laughs> uh, to uh, end as much suffering uh, that's attributed to disease as possible. Uh, that is definitely what gets me up. That's what keeps me up at night. Um, I think that, you know, the thought that, you know, people are suffering right now, that people are dying right now is, uh, is a huge push. Uh, I think that the idea and the, the knowledge that we're essentially all on that road, uh, this actually affects every one of us. Uh, you know, right now with the age that you are and the age that I am, you know, if we had uh, our cells looked at closely, uh, our body system looked at closely, it's quite possible we could already determine what we would, we would be dying of uh, in, in the hopefully far off future. We want to push that off as far as possible. Mm -hmm. And what's the path towards realizing that dream in your view? alleviating suffering and postponing death for an indefinite period of time or aging? Uh, well, the two words would be gene therapy. Uh, the one word would be do. It would be a verb. We, we just have to do it. And, and that's what our company is all about. It's about really changing how we do healthcare. It's, it's changing how we motivate people to get involved now. It has a lot to do with pioneering spirits about encouraging you to think about life a lot differently, encouraging people to, to take the uh, risks now, whether that's financial risks or social risks, to get out there and say that this is what we should be doing. Or maybe even uh, for people in compassionate care scenario, taking the risks to try a therapy now that could reverse their disease and change the future for mankind. Well, perhaps now is the moment to tell us a little bit about BioViva and sort of the, its mission and sort of its strategic 
uh, approach to solving those, uh, those problems in reality, in practice. Right. So BioViva, uh, we're a gene therapy company, and we do gene therapies for compassionate care and consensual use. Uh, we are targeting aging as a disease. Uh, so what that means is that we're actually looking at gene therapies that appear in research and in human tissue studies, some of them in human studies, to reverse systems of aging, uh, whether that be epigenetic changes, um, muscle mass changes, reversal of atherosclerotic plaques, uh, cleaning up of DNA na damage and uh, misfolded proteins. So we're looking at uh, gene therapies that have the most impact for everyone now. I, I let me let me see if I can ask you something here, which I think is kind of relevant too. I watched another interview with you where you said that you are sometimes known as a fire starter and not <laughs> everyone's favorite person. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and how it, and if that may be relevant here? Well, I I think that I think that that perception is actually changing quite quickly. Uh, it seems like people in the past who didn't really want to touch uh, my ideas of that you know we should work in humans now that we we need to give up on the animal models and we need to find out what happened in people what will happen in people today because uh, you know the animal models don't all translate um, people are dying uh, today of diseases uh, who should have a right to try use of experimental medicine what's considered experimental medicine I have just, I think that I have a, a real strong desire to change things from the very basis of, of how we think about medicine, in, including the fact that I think that we need to rethink what we think safety and efficacy is. And so that, that stirs a lot of, of debate and in, in conversation. So for instance, you know, gene therapy is considered experimental medicine. But everything that's ever passed through the FDA is still an experiment. And as a matter of fact, people are dying taking it. Uh, we're not seeing a math, massive health span uh, extension. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, the United States is only 5% of the population of the globe, of the whole earth. We take 75% of all the prescription drugs, and we have the shortest lifespan of every industrialized country. Um, I have questions about that, and I think that we can do it better. I think we can do a better job at medicine, and I think that we need to move very quickly. And I don't think that uh, everyone agrees with that, but more and more people are getting on board. Uh, more and more people who listen to me speak, who look into what we're doing, are, are coming on board. And these are people who in the past had been um, kind of quiet about uh, their involvement uh, with BioViva, and they now think that it is actually the way to go. That, that's very interesting, Liz. So, so tell us how, for example, uh, your uh, personal choice to be a vegetarian also kind of enhances or goes kind of in support of or, or, or perhaps shows something about who you are and what you stand for. <laughs> oh boy, you have done your, your research. Uh, okay, so as far as being a vegetarian, how does that, you know, I think that probably the interesting thing about being, being a vegetarian is kind of, you know, sticking with your choices. Um, that would probably what it would show in me. I definitely stick with my choices. Um, and I understand how to do without. So, and I'm okay with that. You know, I, I'm okay with uh, taking risks and I'm okay with uh, doing without for what I stand for. So I eat dinner with a lot of people who eat meat and uh, I don't ever say, oh, well, I got to have some of that or, or maybe I'll take some of that. Uh, I uh, stick by my choices and I guess maybe there it shows a little bit of, of integrity. I don't think that it's something that I push off on anyone else. I don't push anyone uh, to uh, to uh, join me in in that. And so I think that it also shows that you know I'm compassionate to other people's needs and desires. And you know I, I never go on the preaching mode of of why you should do this too. I, I do it and uh, and see if uh, see if it uh, causes any reaction in in the people around me. I guess and usually it doesn't. 
Uh, well, the reason why I'm asking all those personal questions is because I, I think it's actually important to kind of pull the curtain a little bit on the person, not only the scientist, but, but also the person on the sort of, and reveal the humanity, if you will, and, and the personal uh, characteristics, the, the, the persona behind the work, which, which I, I personally find always very fascinating. So let me ask you this. Are you uh, an ethical vegetarian, meaning uh, you made that choice because you think that uh, it is the, the ethically right choice to make? Or are you a health vegetarian, meaning that you just believe that being a vegetarian provides better health outcomes for you personally? I'm actually both. Uh, I feel that it, it does create a better health out, outcome, but believing in gene therapy, maybe I would think that I could uh, eradicate uh, that from the equation. Uh, I think ethically, I, that's the reason probably why I stick with it the most. I think that it is a smart thing to do if you don't need it, if it has no health, uh, uh, you know, uh, ill effects on your body. Uh, so, gosh, this is the, this is an interesting conversation because I, I don't think about this very much, and I was asked about this before. I think that as a society and as a world, we will move more and more towards this, but in fact, there are things like cultured meat that will probably take its place slowly. And I do believe in that. I might even try that in the future. And that's when they culture meat from stem cells. Uh, the amount of space on the earth that we use for farming and the way we treat animals is actually pretty poor. If we want to reach other um, uh, planets, if we want to uh, expand, if we want to uh, really learn how to be efficient, this isn't actually a very efficient way to eat. So I think that uh, being a vegetarian uh, by choice is, is both health and ethical, and it actually will have great implications for the future of mankind in how we treat the planet, what we do on the planet, how efficient we are, and uh, you know, cultured meat and things like that are a fantastic way to, to take uh, protein substances to space. Mm -hmm. You know, let me share with you honestly that uh, this is perhaps one of my biggest flaws here because um, I personally agree with you ethically speaking on everything that you said. Um, and I'm failing to follow through on that kind of ethical understanding with proper action. And the reason for that is that, you know, from health point of view, from a selfish health point of view, I've talked to a lot of people here, both on my show and otherwise, who, you know, have pretty much convinced me that uh, vegetarianism and especially veganism is particularly uh, dangerous for your health. Uh, and, and my wife uh, was trying, I've, I've done, uh, you know, certain periods of time uh, on vegetarianism. And my wife tried it for an extended period of time, and she had substantial health issues uh, as a result. Um, so, and of course, some people do better than others on it. So I am, I think, actually, in fact, in contrast to her, one of those who does a lot better uh, than, than most people. And yet, first, for me, it's hard to, to kind of keep it consistent for, let's say, more than a couple of months. And, and, and two... You know, the scientific evidence that I've been exposed to convinces me otherwise. Mm -hmm. So ethically speaking, I agree with you. From health point of view, I disagree. And, and I find this the biggest personal flaw in myself that I'm unable to make the right choice. Because usually I prefer to make the right choice. And that's the only situation pretty much that I can think of that I am really not living my message. And it really bugs me, to be honest. Well, actually, I mean, I think that you have to do uh, what actually makes you feel healthy and what helps you uh, get things done in the world. So I, I think that if you feel like it's an unhealthy choice, uh, then it's not for you. I certainly, um, from the point I was eating a lot of meat to the point where I'm a vegetarian, I have not seen any health detriment. Um, I think that I actually have more energy, which is actually a little bit frightening. 
Uh, but that's for me, and it is quite possibly, uh, it is quite possible that we all are a little bit different in our nutritional needs, and so you definitely want to optimize for for what your body needs, and you know what that feels like uh, more than I do. So I do, I do occasionally take an iron pill, and I occasionally take vitamins, and that might make a difference, um, and that might be why I tolerate it so well. Uh, but you know, it's, I think that. Precision medicine is really going to help us with that. And it might be that some, for some people, a vegetarian diet is a benefit. And it might be for other persons that it's not. And it could come down to um, not just, you know, blood type and the things that we've heard before, but it might come down to how you metabolize your food and what you need from your food. And, you know, maybe in the future we can, we can change that metabolism. So what I'm saying is that I, I'm a proponent for these new uh, types of meat. I think that those will be fantastic and those will actually change a lot of the ethical issues in the future. And it'll also make us, uh, you know, more advanced in, in our, our food and in our thinking. I think that synthetic food to me is, is I have a big excitement about that. Uh, I like the idea of shakes and, and getting every, all of your nutrition in one place. And I think that that, it not only helps us be sustainable, it helps us get to other planets. Like I said, it helps with space travel. And I think that we'll find that actually uh, almost synthetically feeding our cells uh, will be uh, more beneficial than a lot of the, the food sources we have now uh, because they will give us exactly what we need. So for every you know, bite of food that you eat, there's a level of nutrition benefits and there's a level of toxicity. Some of those are similar. Some go hand in hand and some are separate. Uh, I think that in the future, we'll want to be really efficient. We'll want to give ourselves exactly what they need so that we can get on with it. And you know, sitting down to an heirloom dinner will be a special occasion. And it'll be a wonderful thing. Uh, but I think that we'll look at a lot of these foods that we eat now and we'll think, oh, Oh, tomatoes so toxic, you know, artichokes, uh, asparagus so horrible for you, but for tonight we'll sit down and eat those. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a, that's a fascinating topic, but I don't want to hijack uh, our our conversation today. So perhaps uh, we, we'll we'll have another opportunity to discuss it one day in person. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, let's get back here to the main topic uh, here, which is uh, BioViva. So what do you offer or hope to offer to the world? Okay, so we're going to start out with a couple of therapies. Uh, we're, we're starting out with a myostatin inhibitor that we're very excited about. Uh, we're initially chasing it for sarcopenia. So sarcopenia is muscle wasting. It happens over time as you get older. Uh, it definitely enhances uh, muscle mass. Uh, but we have some anecdotal data. It's very basic data that we're chasing that it might actually reverse atherosclerotic plaques. And if that was the case, we might be able to take a, a killer off of the off of the chart, off of the graph that kills you know over one third of the population in industrialized countries. That would be fantastic. Okay, so that's one of the things that that we've got. We think that people will be really interested in this. Uh, for sarcopenia, frailty kills about six percent of the population. Uh, that's actually a really low number compared to how many times we've heard so and so broke their hip and they died you know so that's a sarcopenia type accident uh we are very excited about this. Uh, we think that uh, anyone over 40 could be a great candidate for this. Um, and we want to get people out and get people active again, uh, get out running and hiking and doing all those things that you know people tend to put down as they get a, a little bit older. The second thing that we're going after, and this is a, a real big excitement, is we're going to bring in human root use, human use of uh, telomerase. Uh, induction in the cells. And so this is actually an epigenetic type gene therapy. This goes in and it should lengthen telomeres. It should turn off genes that turn on over time. A lot of people don't realize that as you get older, you often have more genes turned on uh, than you did when you're younger because we all feel like we're, we're lacking something. But in fact, we've gained <laughs> a bunch of proteins that we don't want. Uh, so we're excited about this. We're hoping that it's going to shore up the cell, make it act young and youthful like it does in vitro and in, in all the human tissue that it's been applied to. 
we want to chase uh, our, uh, Alzheimer's with this, actually. So we've started to run a campaign to raise some money for Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's has no cure. It, this year, in 2015, it affects uh, 5.3 million people. Uh, it's a devastating disease. Uh, the reason it's a great disease to work in is because people see the loss in their loved one over time. It affects the whole family. So we feel that for compassionate use, more people will step forward and say this is the right thing to do because you have to convince people to spearhead uh, new medicine and new ideas. And so we want to uh, is in essentially inject uh, directly to the brain and see if we can stimulate the microglia to clean up the beta amyloids and also to stimulate the neurons. Even though they're non-dividing, there's evidence that neurons that have telomerase induction will actually start cleaning up some of the tau tangles. And so we want to see if in fact this will work. You know, this, this could potentially be a cure instead of uh, just amelioration of the disease uh, waiting for people to die. So we're excited about those two therapies. We have a patent that may in fact work for uh, diseases like ALS and Parkinson's and we're really excited about this and this was based on the work that our doctor did with stem cells. Uh, he was uh, injecting stem cells uh, to the brain with ALS patients and he would see this, these great results. He would see uh, patients who hadn't walked starting to stand up. He would see patients who hadn't spoken uh, starting to speak. Of course, you know, the, the great benefits would only last for a short period of time. And actually, they would come on much too quickly. He said, you know, this couldn't be neural growth. This couldn't be, you know, microglia reestablishing themselves because it was happening really quickly. So he basically uh, chased a, a paper trail on it of research and realized that probably it was uh, something called H factor. And so now we have a gene therapy based around that. We would like to take that through uh, research to see if it would work for things like Parkinson's and ALS. It would actually be a gene therapy that instead of the stem cells signaling H factor, it would be a gene therapy that would create, would allow the cells in the brain. So you can get different cells of your body to do different things. It's just creating proteins. So it would actually stimulate them to create the H factor. And what H factor does is it tells all the cells to start talking to each other. Start talking, start talking, start talking. And in that communication, you see um, whole systems start to uh, redevelop and communications between cells start to redevelop and um, cells that are damaged start to repair their damage. And so we're hoping that this gene therapy would be of massive benefit, again, in a place where there is no cure. So we're really excited about these three therapies, uh, the, the later one obviously still needing some research. So you've got arteriosclerosis, ALS, Parkinson, and Alzheimer's. <laughs> yeah, but for you know for the the the, uh, the Alzheimer's treatment for so for telomerase induction, uh, that gene therapy in itself, uh, you know, if we can prove it on Alzheimer's, uh, we will move that to almost every disease state. We, we will try that same therapy uh, because it works on the level of the aging cells. So, you know, you don't get Alzheimer's when you're young. Uh, you start to get symptoms, that, signs of it. Uh, we can actually look in brains and start to see things now. They're, they're finding it at the ages around uh, the 20s. Uh, but in fact, you don't come down with it because it's, a, it's an aging disease. And so that's why we see aging as a disease. If we start tackling what's happening and make those cells behave young, reverse the aging, in those cells, you should be as likely to come down with Alzheimer's as you were when you were 15, mm -hmm. which, is, which is about 0%. Yes, yeah, so, so I thought it's ambitious or beyond ambitious even when, when I listed the, the, the diseases that you're attempting to, to cure, basically, and, and now you're making it even an order of magnitude bigger. So what, what, how does one approach modest goals like these what's kind of the 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 thinking behind your strategy what are the steps what are the benchmarks what are the the things that you have to do to make it happen okay so what we have to do is obviously funding is is number one you you have to get money in uh the the reason that we chose the diseases that we chose is that uh these 
these gene therapies uh, show strong evidence of, of reversing aging, okay? So if we can do that, that's the way we can get on top of them. The reason that we chose uh, the severe disease, like something like Alzheimer's, okay, is because, again, like I said, we need public support. We need, we need support from the public that it is okay to go ahead and use these gene therapies. And maybe they wouldn't feel so confident using those in a healthy person. You know, with heart disease, heart disease is uh, a major killer, more than a third of the population. But the person with heart disease is having a conversation with you, knows who you are up until the point they have a, a heart attack and, and die on the couch. So, you know, the, those people might uh, feel less confident, but when a family has someone with Alzheimer's, they know the loss almost immediately. By the time that you're actually diagnosed, you know, up to 40% of your neurons are damaged in your brain. You know, there, there, is, there is very little hope right now. And hope to me is a four-letter word. I, uh, I don't like the word hope very much, but what we want to do is see if what we have right now with technology that has 16 years of research on it, move forward for people who have no other choice now and see if in fact we can reverse their diseases and save their lives. Yeah, so tell us a little bit more about your fundraiser, please. Okay, so Max Life Foundation uh, actually is running a funding a fundraiser for BioViva, and they're giving a hundred percent of everything earned to BioViva. So we're really excited about that, and it's just for uh, Alzheimer's. So the idea is to raise a quarter million dollars to treat three Alzheimer's patients uh, with this gene therapy, and see if we can get results. What if someone says, well? $250,000 for three Alzheimer patients, but then what? Well, actually, one Alzheimer's patient, if we, if, we, if we could take one Alzheimer's patient and get the results that they had in mouse studies where old mice's brains uh, redeveloped, uh, and if we could reverse Alzheimer's in just one patient, uh, we, we would be sitting on uh, a, a real uh, advancement. A revolutionary treatment. Oh, yeah. One, N equals one is where actually uh, precision medicine is going. You know, trying to, to force a bunch of people through uh, clinical trials, thousands of people, you know, when, when, it, when, some, when one drug cures 100% of a small subset, but none of the other people, and then the drugs don't get passed, that's, that's the wrong way to do it. As we learn more and more about the genome, we're going to change that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but an N equals one study even with uh, Alzheimer's patients, telomerase induction and reversing that disease would be worth a billion mice studies. You know, we have to stop putting our mind into animal models that don't translate perfectly. We have people who are dying now. This is really the right thing to do. We need a mandate. And that's what I'm trying to tell you is through social acceptance, through the acceptance of, of the community, we need a mandate that people have the right to try these therapies now. Fantastic. So tell us a little bit more about how we can go to uh, contribute perhaps to that uh, fundraising campaign and uh, how, how far are you from your goal? Okay, so that actually just started. Um, I believe that it just went live yesterday. I know that we've had donations, but I don't know because actually uh, BioViva will actually have to apply to uh, get that money with a grant uh, for uh, actually the transferal of funds from Max Life, and they'll tell us when when they're ready for us to to submit that. And we have to, you know, we have actually we already have the protocol and in all of the things that we need in line on our side. Uh, so that is just started. I can't remember. Oh. You can go to BioVivaSciences.com, and that's where you'll want to go to get the link to the Max Life uh, website. It will actually take you directly to the fundraiser instead of just going to their main page and having to find it. Yeah, I'll post the link myself uh, in the show notes. Um, let me ask you to sort of pull back a little bit and zoom out and, and look at the sort of the big picture of aging, if we can. And let's perhaps start by definition what is aging how do we define it because you see 
after interviewing 170 people about the singularity, one of the first things that I've noticed is that everyone is talking about a little bit different flavor and sometimes very big different flavor about the thing we're discussing. So I want to make sure we start out by laying the foundation. What is aging and how do we define it? Aging is cellular degeneration over time. And so biological aging obviously is what we're going after. We're not going after chronological aging. We can make that really clear. We want you to get really old in numbers, <laughs> but not cellularly. So it's cellular degeneration over time. It's DNA damage. It's misfolded protein accumulation. It's depletion of stem cells or actually the miscommunication between the stem cells and the rest of the body. Often we die with a lot of very good uh, robust stem cells, but there's just no communication between the niches anymore. Uh, it, it's, it's a lot of things. The DNA damage can come down to damage that happens, you know, from radiation, the sun, to damage that just comes with replication errors. Uh, so we, we see, oh, you know, st problems in, in cell signaling. We see telomere loss. We see many of these things. Um, so I think that our definition of, of uh, biological aging is very similar to other people's uh, definition of them. It's just how to solve it. And I don't think that many people argue with uh, the techniques that we would use to move forward uh, to try to solve this problem. We can't say that any one of these therapies will do uh, everything that we need to be done. Uh, we can't say that they will, that one gene therapy will shore up every issue. Uh, but we have an indication that, uh, one or two, maybe three or four, uh, may in fact, uh, do a lot of benefit and get us to the point where we have enough research, uh, to take the next steps. And it may be possible because everyone's genome's a little bit different that yeah, lengthening your telomeres and turning off genes will be fantastic for everyone. But if you've got a person that makes a specific protein, they might more be more susceptible to another uh, jab at aging that, that we have to uh, get under control. But we definitely think that starting now is the time to start. We start now and we find out what we've got. Maybe we're sitting on everything we need and maybe we're not, but there's no time like the present. We can't wait another 20 years uh, to do this <laughs> for sure. You're very action oriented and I love that. But but let me let me give you the sort of the, the classic um, skeptic slash critic approach, which is to say the proper realm of medicine is to treat disease or medical conditions. Curing aging and defeating death is snake oil. It's been attempted since, you know, the epic of Gilgamesh and it's snake oil. We can't do it. We haven't done it. We don't know how to do it and we probably shouldn't do it because it's not normal. It's natural for us to age, whether you take sort of the evolutionary approach and you say that's how we evolved to be by, by nature by sort of evolutionary design or by sort of the grand design of the almighty God who created us to be mortal and therefore we ought to remain so. Okay. Well, I have actually a lot of answers for that. And I'll go back. I'll go back. I'm actually going to take them in reverse to your last statements, hopefully to your first ones, and let me know if I've, I'm missing anything here. One of my teachers, uh, one of actually my chemistry teachers, uh, was so fantastic. And um, he, you know, when a lot of people uh, had had lost their, their faith in anything in science and everything like that, he had said, there is actually no more evidence on earth than science of God. He said that there, a man working his entire life to achieve one increment in something that he can't see the bigger picture of is the, is the, is the biggest sign of God. And I thought that this was really interesting because everyone in the classroom was like, what? And um, he, he pointed out uh, how many people have died along the road to creating great things. And they knew that they were just an increment in, in something bigger. And it's almost like ants, like we're building something and we're working towards something. So then let me go back to the other statement. That, that doesn't define what I think or, or how I believe, uh, by the way. So 
Then let's go back to the other statement of what is normal. Uh, we've been changing what is normal over time uh, for, for hundreds of years now. So when people say, well, it's normal to die of aging, it's normal to die of old age, actually, I have a whole presentation for that. It's not normal to die of aging. Actually, what's normal is to die before the age of 30 of infectious disease. And that's how humans died up until you know a couple hundred years ago. Uh, across the board. Very few people live to old age. That was actually considered abnormal. Uh, so uh, the normal way to die for humans is of infectious disease before 30. What has knocked that off the board is medicine. Uh, immunizations and antibiotics, workplace safety and sanitation, those things uh, changed the game for everyone, okay? That's why we live as long as we do now. That's why we think this is normal, but this is actually recent, very, very recent history. This wasn't your great-great-grandmother's history. This is your, you know, maybe your great-grandmother's history, uh, depending on how close together your family had children, and definitely your grandmother's history. But this is, this is all new thinking, we're just taking it one step further. We're saying that the path is, uh, the human path is to solve the next problem. And so we're solving that problem. So with BioViva, I know that everyone does get excited about infinite lifespans. And obviously, you know, I can, uh, of all the people I've talked to, I've talked to very religious people and people who are not, and everybody loves what we do. They like the idea of eradicating disease. They like the idea of living longer. I've never had a religious person actually say it. Well, I think that that's against God. When they look at things like gene therapy and, and things like that, they might, they might have a, a initial hesitation, but then they're like, oh no, that is what we want. <laughs> you know, we want to eradicate disease. I mean, what did Jesus do? Jesus went around, you know, curing people from disease and, and, and you know, and being a, a general good guy. Now, definitely he got crucified for that. <laughs> and we don't want to get crucified for that. Uh, but, you know, he, he got some pretty bad treatment for doing some pretty great things, I guess, you know, I'm not, I, I have no knowledge of the Bible, by the way, I was not raised religious. Um, so I, I have very little understanding, but this has been a debate and it has been a topic of interest. And I have specifically taken uh, my argument or, or what I would like to do to religious people to see how um, that, that, um, that bounces off of them. So I, I would say that we, we've already changed what's normal for humans, that we're on the road to changing it some more. I think that uh, curing uh, aging as a disease is something that is an obvious ne next step. You know, science sees the next, the next roadblock, and we're going to do that. With BioViva, we don't talk a lot about expanding lifespan beyond, beyond 120 years. We talk about living youthfully and productively in society, being part of the economy, you know, being part of, of, of the great development and not being part of this massive debt that is created through health problems. So there's a lot of benefits uh, to living healthy, youthfully as possible, as long as possible. So we just talk about, you know, skidding you in on that 120 years, looking like you did when you're 20, uh, feeling like you did when you're 20, if we can do it. That's our target. Because if you don't look young, aging isn't just an outside thing. It's not just a thing where, you know, you get gray hair, you lose your hair, you get wrinkles. That those are just the outward signs. What's happening inside your body is just as is devastating, if not more. As a matter of fact, I've got a great uh, slide of a 27-year-old brain that's been imaged and an 87-year-old brain that's been imaged. And if you look at the 87-year-old brain compared to this 27-year-old, the the amount of damage and atrophy in that brain is so much worse than the outward symptoms that that person has on, in their skin, and yet this. This patient, this 87-year-old patient in this slide didn't even have dementia. You know, so people need to, to realize that this is, this is like going on internally, and those are the things that are going to kill you, right? Like, you know, if, you're, if people talk about, you know, external youth, it seems really actually very shallow because cosmetics have been that way up until now, okay? It, if you look, if you have more youthful looking skin or, you know, you've had a nip and a tuck and you've never really taken care of the internal issues, with these new therapies, uh, we're actually going to be running a, a, a in vivo skin test with uh, telomerase induction. With these new therapies, uh, looking youthful on the outside is going to be a reflection of how you look on the inside. And those are 
those are the important uh, parts of, of staying youthful, healthy as long as possible. So we can talk about indefinite lifespans because that's really exciting. You know, of all the people I talk to, you know, I can never pin on them when they want to die. <laughs> you know, even the most religious people, it's like, well, you know, would you like to die tomorrow? Would you like to die when you're 87? When you're 87, at that point, you know, you know, will you be able to sit with me and say, yes, I'm ready to die? I mean, you, there, there are very few people who are ready to die uh, besides the clinically depressed, right? Like people just, you know, they have this robustness. My, my grandma, Lila, I remember I lived with her for a, over a year and I, I loved living with my grandma. But one of the, the things that I always remembered, I could never forget it. And I was a really young kid. I was you know, 10 or 11. Uh, she looked in the mirror and she said, I just don't recognize this person. You know, like I, you always feel like you, but how, how everything it's, it's like, you know, it's like you're deteriorating around who you are but you don't feel any different. And, and those were the outward looks, the things that were happening to her internally were just as devastating, if not more so. And she did actually die from Alzheimer's. Wow. So I bet that plays part of the motivation why you're so passionate about this. <laughs> it is one of the motivations. Uh, uh, actually, I got into this uh, to cure childhood disease. I, I didn't actually get into the science to um, to be in the longevity realm. I ended up uh, going to a SENS conference in UK at Cambridge. Aubrey de Grace conference? Yes, yes. And uh, I remember I emailed them a lot and saying, you know, why would I, why would I be going to this? You know, I was, I was into, into the genetic aspects of, of what they were doing. But uh, a couple of the people who were involved in even Aubrey himself emailed me back and said, you know, come and check it out. I, I, think, that, I think that you'll like it. And so I think I bought the ticket uh, just a few days before and I got a plane ticket about two days before which I never want to do again because I paid heartily for coach <laughs> which is what I fly I'm I'm into saving money but the thing is is I really probably paid a first class uh ticket uh, price. So, um, but I went and I sat there and I listened and I thought this is how we're going to do it. We're going to cure kids by, you know, fighting the first old man's war. We've got all of these people who are dying of disease and we can find out now if what we've got will work. And um, at that point, it was looking a little sketchy, a little unknown about uh, what would happen with the body if we did these things. I know that that, that was just a couple years ago. Here's how fast things are moving. I sat down with some experts during that conference and they said, Liz, 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 you know, because I said, well, how long could we live? They said, well, you know, you can only push it off so far because actually we know everyone will go blind. We know everyone will go blind. One year, the next Sense conference, there people at Berkeley and other persons were actually talking about their gene therapies that reverse macular degeneration. You know, that actually, you know, that's it's just so fast. You know, we're we're getting a heads up on that. We don't have to go blind <laughs> now. You know, we've got a gene therapy for that. And um, and we're just gonna knock them off, you know, one after the other, just like that. But we got to do it now. We got to do it in people. We and we've got so many people in need. It's the right thing to do. That's fantastic. I, I love I love how passionate you are about this, uh, and and I, I absolutely wish you success in in everything that you do. But I do think that uh, people like you do do end up make a difference. So just uh, keep at it. Now, tell for people like us or like me. Uh, who are ignorant of uh, the, the details surrounding gene therapy. Uh, can you please tell us a little bit more about how gene therapy, what, what gene therapy is to begin with and how does it work? Oh, yeah. It's very elegant. You're going to love gene therapy. Uh, so I, I've talked to many people, people who are into holistic medicine, people who are into, you know, uh, pharmaceuticals, people who are into massive interventions and no interventions, and everybody loves gene therapy. Uh, so <laughs> it's what we do is we listen to what your cell needs. Okay. We listen to the genome in a sense, and we, we listen to what you need. We, we have very little information now. We'll have more information in the future. How do you listen with the genetic testing? 
What you can do, yeah. So for monogenic disease, uh, those, those patients would have genetic testing. Often they're missing a gene or they have a bad gene. Okay. And you listen for the player in the sense. So think of it as an orchestra. You listen for the player and you hear the bad player. Okay. Right now with gene therapy, what we do with gene therapy is we take, in our case, we take a viral vector. Um, this cannot get you sick. It's, it's not something that infects humans. Uh, it does work in these cases. We take out its ability to replicate. So it could never go on to uh, make more of itself. And we cut out the area where it would deliver its payload to a cell. So what, what, Think about it as like a space pod, okay? And then there's the International Space Station, and that's your cell. Here's the International Space Station. And then the space pod is the viral vector, and it hooks on, okay? There's ligands and receptors, and it hooks on, and it delivers the payload, okay? And the payload, in our case now, is our human gene. So we have, we have our target transgene. We insert it into the virus. The virus attaches to the cell it it go ahead it puts that gene right into the cell okay and then that cell starts coding for a protein okay and so now for if you have a monogenic disease you've got one gene that's bad we've replaced that in a sense we've put in a good player and that good player is now ne making the protein that you need and this works for adrenoleukodystrophy that's ALD children with that it works for other uh, symptoms too I just put a great thing a uh, great video on uh, the uh, Facebook about uh, a muscle atrophy disease that infants get and they die within a year and it, it this works it really works I saw that one it was about spinal uh, degeneration right yeah 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 it is and so essentially what your cell is is the place where you hold your chromosomes, your chromosomes code for the proteins that make everything about you. They make those cells, they make what you look like, they make how you feel, they make how much muscle you have and everything else. We upregulate a protein. So that's what gene therapy is. It's the insertion of a gene to upregulate a protein that you need. Now in the future we'll be doing genetic engineering and genomic engineering, which will be a lot different. We'll be editing genes out, putting in good sections of genes, maybe adding things that we didn't have before. Instead of listening for one bad player, we'll be listening to the whole symphony and try to figure out why that player is a bad player. Maybe it's being repressed by another gene. We'll be able to, to play with it by taking, you know, and, and changing out the orchestra. Right now what we do is we just put one gene in at a time. It's, it's limited, but it's actually very powerful. So let me ask you this. I've, I've talked to a number of experts in the field um, for the last maybe four or five years. And so you have people such as uh, Dr. Michael Fossil or Bill Andrews who are big proponents of uh, telomerase therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, you have Aubrey who is like sort of going along the what he called the seven deadly sins of the cell and sense. <laughs> Then, actually, a few weeks ago, I met uh, Dr. Barry Merriman, who is uh, from uh, Human, in, uh, Human Longevity, Inc., the company that was started by Craig Venture and uh, Peter Diamandis. Uh, and he is big on uh, uh, stem cell therapy uh, also. Uh, so what's the path, uh, in your view, that that's the most promising and why? Well, obviously, I mean, the modality, I think, is gene therapy. It's the most promising because it's, it's, a, it's a permanent fix uh, to a situation where we have genes that all of us can benefit from initially. Uh, I think that stem cell use is, is limited. I, I think that stem cells are, are great for um, building organs. I think that they're great for giving the, the system a bit of a bump up, but I think that genomics uh, and gene therapy is just going to be the, the biggest power. Uh, now, the, the ex vivo work with stem cells and gene therapy is fantastic. Um, I think that I think that we're going to really change our thinking. Everything's going to go into the path of, of gene therapy in the future. I've met a lot of people who are huge proponents of stem cell work. They use stem cells for anti-aging and various other things, but you know, none of them look uh, much younger. 
And I think that that is because uh, there's something happening at the genomic level, obviously, and those, those are the areas that we need to solve the problem. So if you just use your own stem cells to, to boost up your system, you will have some regenerative effects. Um, a lot of the stem cells that you use uh, will actually leave the area, and it's the signaling that's, that gets back to the, our patented gene therapy. It's the signaling that has the most benefit. Uh, but you're basically restocking uh, your system with your, your own genome that has the same damages and the the same outcome uh, as as uh, it does now. The great thing with uh, genomics is we can just change that. You know, we can we can change the, the the genes, the proteins that you're creating to make you more healthy, stronger, faster, smarter, whatever it is. We'll we'll figure it out. Perhaps now is the time for you to tell us a little bit more about your South American testing facility. Where is it and what kind of work do you do there? Okay, so we have a clinic in Bogota, Colombia, and uh, predominantly it has been used to treat patients with cancer, although most of those patients are treated in the U.S. now. So our doctor uh, who owns that clinic, um, is a radiologist and does oncology. Uh, he was actually working down there for a while uh, because uh, some of the, the drugs that they were using for cancer immunotherapy were being passed through the FDA, but they weren't quite passed uh, yet, and people were seeking uh, cures for uh, their cancer. They are now passed, and so he's able to do a vast majority of that work in the U.S. Where we're more likely to work with patients is we're getting uh, collaborative efforts with uh, clinics in uh, Bahamas and Mexico right now, uh, but we can uh, definitely work in Colombia. And actually, Bogota, Colombia is quite fantastic. Um, my doctor actually came to uh, San Francisco last January. Uh, we were asked to meet with Pfizer, and so we came and met with them. And, you know, we were walking around some of the streets in San Francisco and he said, boy, I spend, you know, part of my time in Bogota, Colombia, and this is actually scarier. <laughs> you really? know, parts of San Francisco have gotten that, you know, the homeless situation is, uh, is really burgeoned. We really need to do something about that. We need to step up the humanity and, and get these people who are uh, mentally ill uh, off of the street and get them into a safer uh, conditions. Um, yeah, so you know, he said that he actually felt uh, less safe in in San Francisco than he does in Bogota. And I've been there. I've been to Bogota, and and I would agree. There were some areas that we walked through uh, that were actually quite unsavory, but we were safe. Uh, nobody did anything. Um, but let me ask you this here about the humanity, or another word for it that I like very much is ethics. So tell me a little bit about the ethics in genetics. Oh, I think that it just holds uh, such a key to to strong uh, ethic of uh, cures and uh, the 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 power to uh, eradicate so much suffering. And this is it's a uh, it's not a new technology. You know, a lot of the research has been around for sixteen, seventeen years and more for for some of the therapies. Um, I I think that this is a big game changer. This is where we can uh, create a healthier, more robust population, you know, at the very cellular level and, and do it with an injection, you know. So, you know, one thing that we're excited about is if our myostatin inhibitor reverses atherosclerotic plaques, will essentially be taking away the prospect of open heart surgery, which is an absolutely barbaric uh, procedure. Uh, take away, you know, stents that that build up uh, more uh, plaques on them. Uh, we, with an injection, you know, we'll be treating the future. It reminded me a little bit when I got started getting involved with it of, you know, um, was what was it, Star Trek? And, you know, uh, they they walk out and they see somebody on the wall of, of this community, of this this planet who is not, you know, evolved in medicine. And they say, what's wrong with this patient? Oh, she has diabetes and she's dying. And he's like, we cured that a long time ago and they just kind of, zzz, they phase her over her and she's like, fine. You know, I mean, we are not to, to that state, but uh, that's, that's where we're headed is into a place where we're affecting the cells at the cellular level and, uh, and eradicating a lot of the suffering that's going on right now. And anything that holds this science back, 
um, is absolutely unethical. Uh, like I said, you know, you, you can take uh, all of the, the drugs that have been passed through the FDA and they're still an experiment. You know, there are more people that die in one year of adverse drug effects, ADEs, uh, than probably will die in gene therapy over the next 30, 40 years. You know, we've got the viral vectors to the point of, of uh, Im, you know, non-immunogenicity. So people are not having the immune effect that they, they did that, that essentially shut down the industry in the 90s. Uh, we will be, uh, if we're smart, and we're very careful about the genes that we're applying, we shouldn't see toxic effects down the road. You can't do a gene therapy on every gene. I think that that's really important that people understand that. You know, there are some things that very few cells uh, take over. And so if we gave you a gene therapy for, for something like that had to do with a hormone, and then all of those cells divided, then you have twice the hormone. Um, then, you know, that, that, would be, that would be a really bad idea. So we have to be careful with it. And as long as we're careful and we follow the research, I think that we're going to have uh, a massive amount of success and we can create uh, a better ethical uh, management of disease and, and hopefully cures for disease than we have now. Fantastic. Uh, so now is the time to tell us about the next step, which is also quite radical because it's one thing to talk about uh, sort of... Uh, curing uh, therapies that, that would cure certain kinds of disease or conditions or, or even aging. It's another thing to talk about human rights to use those therapies, mm -hmm. which, yeah. which you do on your website. So tell me a little bit about that. And because to me as a Canadian, that strikes me as very different approach than the kind of traditional approach that we see coming from America. Why is that? Is that the case? And, and why is it the, 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 the sort of the policy or, or the trajectory that you want to take on? Well, I think that human rights are, are a huge uh, uh, issue here. I think that, you know, the right to try, the right to use, uh, the right to use uh, experimental therapies, uh, for yourself, uh, regardless of the situation you're in, but especially if you're terminally ill. You know, right now in the United States, in some states, you do have right to try access, but it's only for drugs that have gotten to a certain level of safety and efficacy. And, um, and then you have to get a drug manufacturer to actually make them. And, you know, doing all of this while uh, you're uh, dying of a disease is actually quite difficult. And it's why a lot of people die without the right to try or the right to use. And a lot of people have actually died in this country. Uh, that then their families have gone on to be behind legislation that helps other families uh, while they're waiting for access uh, to these medicines. I want people to learn more about biology. I want them to learn more about their bodies. And I want them to really take uh, control of that and to uh, tell the powers that be that they should have the right to do with uh, their body as they see fit. We want people to be safe. Uh, the FDA has a really important job of making sure that uninformed people don't take uh, therapies that may in fact uh, uh, kill them or uh, be unhealthy or have things like antifreeze in them, which is, which is essentially how they got started. Uh, but we want them to be informed all the way around and not just because uh, one, one company could afford to, uh, to get through uh, a matter of, of testing. Um, you know, the money and safety and efficacy should not go hand in hand. Uh, I've had this conversation with many people. They say, well, it's expensive and, you know, and, and it costs this much to get through the FDA. And I'm not sure why costs and, um, and safety and efficacy are part of one conversation. I think they should be part of uh, two very different conversations. I think that we need to lower the costs. We need to somehow come up with, with almost a, a socialized approach to getting people through uh, these, these testings of these, these great therapies. You know, a lot of the reason uh, that these therapies get blocked is because 
companies don't access them because they're so simple. So a lot of the viral vectors have already been uh, patented, okay? So if you can't patent the viral vector and you can't patent the gene, businesses think that they've then got no reason to move forward with a therapy. Well, if we don't hold the patent for it, if we can't license this technology... Anyone can knock it off. Then anyone can knock it off. But therein lies the cures. If the cure lies in an unpatentable gene that anyone can apply, you still go forward. You go forward even faster. That means that more people can benefit from it. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a money game on either side. There's plenty of money in it. And what about the, the people who would say, well, you need the money game in order to spur innovation? That's because of the cost of innovation right now is so much. If we can bring down the cost of innovating, then you won't need all of that money. And there is good money. There is good money in treatment. Look at all of these anti-aging clinics offshore that really offer very little more than human growth hormone and a nip and a tuck and an exfoliation. <laughs> They bring in millions of dollars. You want to be the person who owns the gene therapy company that does that? I do. Even if I'm one in a billion, and we're saving lives, that every one of those clinics is going to make plenty of money. You know, a, a plenty of money to live a, a nice lifestyle and, do, and be doing the right thing in the meantime. That's where it's at. You know, we have to, we have to think about where we want to go as a, as a people. You know, you want to be the first person to it. You don't want to be the last person to it. You know, it is a, it's a question of ethics all the way around the conversation. I agree very much with you, Liz. That's why my blog, people often confuse that my blog is about technology, but actually technology is just a context. It's a blog about ethics. Um, let me ask you this, this other question, which is a little bit different, but it, we're running out of time a little bit, and, and I want to cover a few other things here before we finish. Tell us a little bit more about your desire for BioViva to be a platform for small biotech. Right. So we have to go out. We've got to prove ourselves first. That's, that's a projected thinking. If we can go out and we can learn how to offshore, cut the costs, do everything at an FDA standard. So we'll bring in specialists so that we have all the paperwork, all the trail that we need to prove what we're doing, an IRB to prove human safety. Uh, if we can do all of this and create um, the platform, then yes, that, that's just, that goes perfectly from the last question and the last answer. We want to help other small biotechs do the same thing off of our platform. They can come to us if they've got something that has, you know, a lot of research behind it and um, has uh, massive benefits to the population. We would love to, to help them uh, do the same thing. You know, we would like all of these companies with, with great technology, whether it's patented or not, have the ability to come back and get breakthrough status in the U.S. and get these uh, treatments, drugs, therapies to people. Fantastic. Uh, so what is the perhaps one thing if you if if some annoying podcast host like myself were to force you to pick the one most exciting thing? that you can choose right now from the whole field, what would that be? <laughs> I think that right now, um, even though I'm really excited about the, our myostatin inhibitor potentially uh, reversing atherosclerotic plaques, because I think that's as equally Im as important because we have no indication that telomerase induction would reverse atherosclerotic plaques for certain. Um, I would, though, I would still have to say the telomerase induction in vivo in a human. Um, that would be the, mo the, the most exciting thing because it, in mice and in every human tissue, it reverses aging. Okay. Uh, again, the brain sizes um, uh, uh, enlarge to, to natural sizes. Fur color goes from gray to brown. Um, 
uh, you know, cognitive ability alongside uh, the the um, re-energizing of the brain seems to to pick back up. I would say that that's the most exciting, and what's really makes it even more exciting is is that people stand on one side of the fence or the other. The old school of thought that telomerase uh, causes cancer, and the the what science actually is pointing at now that in fact it doesn't that it will protect you from cancer i think that these are these are the things uh this is the big therapy uh that everyone will be looking at um you know getting more muscle and uh protecting yourself from heart disease is is equally as important um I think that the two therapies will go hand in hand, and that will be probably our big breakthrough is to do more than one gene therapy on a person and and see if, in fact, uh, we can mitigate a lot of these things. So, um, again, I'm tooting my own horn. I think that we've... Uh, we have we have tried to accumulate the the most exciting therapies uh, with the most research behind them, and finding out what happens in a person is is going to be uh, the the next the thing in the next eighteen months that, that hopefully is going to knock the socks off of the world. Yeah, I was going to ask you what's what's the kind of the timeline on that uh, sort of in vivo testing in 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 a human uh, subject. Or, or in, a, in, a, in humans, basically. Okay. Well, I can't say too much about that uh, right at the moment, uh, but I would say in six to eight months, uh, we, can, we can do another podcast. <laughs> okay. Very good. Very good. So uh, let's hope that when, when the big news, if the big news breaks out, uh, you, you still have time for me. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and, if, and if this one doesn't turn out to be the big shebang like we hoped, then, we'll, then we're just going to go back to, I guess, you know, we've, we've still got the myostatin inhibitor. And then what we have to do is this one is just, you know, figure out how to make it work better. But uh, we're, we're feeling we're, we're really excited about this. Uh, Liz, I, I had Jack and Drake uh, uh, a few weeks ago on my show. Are you familiar with him? He is this 15-year-old kid that came out with this kind of unique uh, pancreatic test cancer. Oh, I do remember hearing about him. Oh, that's fantastic. What, is, what a bright, bright fellow. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask you, but uh, you're probably not familiar with his research because there are some skeptics about his work there. The sort of the jury is out on on his kind of breakthrough on cancer test, uh, and and one of the skeptics is actually Dr. George Church, who of course is one of your advisors uh, for BioViva. So I, I wanted to see if you were familiar with with his work by any chance, and if you could give us your take on it. But I am not familiar with it. Yeah, if I yeah, I am not familiar with it. That's okay. That's okay. Um, okay, so I, I think. We've spent well over an hour talking, and we unfortunately will have to bring <laughs> our conversation to an end. Uh, even though I have to admit I'm having a total blast here, and I'm learning <laughs> a lot as we go, so it's hard for me to 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 call it a day. But uh, let me ask you: if you were to rate your own chances of success within, let's say, a five-year period, let's not say eight, six to eight months, let's say five years, to be generous, what? is the sort of the number that you would assign to your potentiality of success on any of that, of those conditions that you've mentioned, let, let alone all of them. But I, I think even one of them will be totally revolutionary. Okay. So, you know, if I rated my success, I would have a really hard time pinning it down to one thing. I, I Probability of success. Success to me will be um, actually getting these therapeutics uh, to the world. I think that we will have a very high potential for success in Alzheimer's, especially the earlier we catch it. And I think that what we're going to find with gene therapy is that preventative medicine through gene therapy will be uh, point one. We're, we're going to want to get to patients before the damage incurs, but in order to get uh, the public mandate, we have to work in very sick patients, and then we have to work back from there. Okay? Uh, we are working uh, with companies who have uh, molecules to that 
they claim and in their testing do regrow neurons. Neurons are, are uh, non-dividing cells. And so even if we reversed uh, Alzheimer's in a patient that, that was pretty late on, we would need to come up with ways to, to regrow neural cells. Now, ma actually, they may do incredibly well uh, with what they have as long as the damage has been mitigated and the cell signaling starts back up. I don't know if you just saw it, but this week there was a guy's uh, story that went around Facebook Facebook, who essentially doesn't have a brain Absolutely, is what yeah, yeah. and yeah, he just has all of that neural uh, growth sort of like around his skull which in he's a you know he's a, a math major and, and various other things normal intelligence and so it, we may not need uh, to redevelop the whole brain, but of course we'll want to, and we know that in there uh, in lies the damage. Uh, I think that, again, our successes will be working in late-stage patients and then working back earlier and earlier in people and then getting them therapies, uh, therapeutics, gene therapies that work before they're diagnosed. But by... Uh, but by traditionally diagnosed. People will be diagnosed younger and younger, okay? Uh, so those, that's where we'll hit uh, our biggest targets, but we may have a massive amount of success in these later stages, and what we need to do is we need to find out. And so I'm, I'm not very good at running numbers there. With sarcopenia, with our myostatin inhibitor, I think we're going to have massive success. We're seeing success there. Our same gene therapy is in actual phase three clinical trials with Nationwide Children's Hospital uh, for a different uh, indication. It's in there for Becker's muscular dystrophy. So safety and efficacy has been proven on that, and I think that moving forward with that for sarcopenia right now is a mandate. Uh, we feel really confident with that. Uh, the chances of reversing atherosclerotic plaques in every patient, I would say we're going to be in really high percentages of success if our anecdotal data is correct, but we have to we have to flesh that out. So I'm not real good about giving numbers here, but I think that we're going to be uh, successful across the board, and I think that gene therapy and BioViva are going to be a huge success. Uh, so I would be conservative there. Uh, targeting aging in general, I think we're going to uh, uh, have a, a great success. Uh, uh, but, you know, we won't know if we can hit every indication, every pathway of aging uh, until we start. And so we have to get on onto that. Uh, as well. So, you know, my level of success is, is something that is, even if we're, we're massively successful in a few human bodies right now, my level of success is uh, held by the gatekeepers of how these things come to the public. And so that all lies in the balance of public consensus and what the public demands uh, for themselves and how fast we can get uh, that going. Well, I do wish you the very best uh, on your sort of very important uh, mission. <laughs> uh, and I can see that you're totally committed to it, so I, I applaud you for that. Um, let me ask you, before we get to the last two questions, is there a, sort of a misconception that's really popular out there about your work and what you do that really bugs you and that you want to kind of clear out once and for all? Oh, yeah, definitely. I think that, you know, I, I don't watch very many movies or TV, um, but I do see things that come through, you know, these this sort of uh, venues of like, you know, gene therapy is going to create, you know, make you have black blood and, and start eating your neighbors or something, you know, you, and AI is going to create this world where, you know, um, whole cities will be blowing up from massive power surges that, you know, um, aren't even uh, possible. But uh, so I think that the, the biggest thing about uh, gene therapy is that it's, it's not a monstrous science. Um, it doesn't create black blood and make you start eating your neighbors. As a matter of fact, our, 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 our biggest, um, you know, uh, um, challenge to get over is actually targeting enough cells to to make changes okay we have to we have to uh, actually put a lot of of uh, viral vectors in a lot of delivery uh, to get an effect okay so bioviva is not the umbrella corporation and we're not going to see the zombie apocalypse <laughs> you are not going to see the zombie apocalypse from us. No, that you know. I think that people need to know that it, it's it's uh, it has a lot of safety behind it. Uh, we're building on that. Um, that uh, it, it's not a scary, um, you know, monstrous thing. You know, you're not going to uh, grow fangs and and have the desire for blood.
<laughs> and and what's the best place for people to find more about you and your work? Oh, the best place to go to is BioVivaSciences.com. Uh, another place you can go is you can go to the NIH uh, clinicaltrials.gov and learn about the other gene therapies that are going on right now that are going through U.S. clinical trials. Hundreds of people are going through gene therapy trials. And, you know, like the video I shared, infants are going through it. So, you know, um, you know, before you put a label of G GMO on people, uh, look at some of the patients that are actually getting these treatments. Uh, realize that, you know, these patients uh, need help now. Realize that aging is not a, a normal thing, uh, that it's something that we can ta tackle, biological aging, and that, in fact, uh, you may be uh, working towards being in just as great of need as that infant or the child with muscular dystrophy, you know, or the person with a rare blood disorder. Uh, uh, think about things differently. Open up your mind uh, to the possibilities. Realize that hundreds of people right now are going through gene therapies and having uh, great success. And uh, look into the future of what gene therapy might hold for you. Fantastic. Uh, and and if I'm to, uh, to give you even another opportunity to give us sort of the final message or the most important thing that you'd like us to take away from this very long and I think... Uh, illuminating and enlightening conversation with you, what would you like that to be? I would like everyone to think of their future in, in a really different way. I'd like to, to think of your life as being more unlimited. I'd like you to think of uh, what you would like to do for work for the second half of your life. Um, I would like you to Think of how you can help expedite these sciences, uh, whether you can get financially involved, whether you can share our information on Facebook and social media sites, uh, whether you can tell your legislator that you know, you're looking into gene therapy and that you want a mandate for people to be able to use that, whether you want to look at the human right aspect of, of your ability to do with your body as you see fit, if you want to look into diseases and start reaching out to communities, asking hospitals uh, uh, research hospitals, if they're offering things like gene therapy, you know, really start pushing uh, towards this because it affects you. It actually affects everyone. The, the, that is the, the, the most interesting thing about the platform of aging. There's no one who runs outside of that. You know, if you, you think that you're healthy for your age, I mean, I think that that's fantastic. Uh, but, you know, look at some of our slides of what healthy for your age is for an 87-year-old compared to a 27-year-old. You know, if your doctor gives you a clean bill of health, uh, that actually uh, doesn't, that means for your age. And what we want to do is we want to take that back and, and get you climbing mountains and uh, running around. And we don't want uh, your care in the future to look like palliative care. Uh, we want it to look like uh, care for yourself. <laughs> that sounds like a fantastic vision and a great place to stop our conversation for today. But I will try and uh, get in touch with you six or eight months later and see if, if we okay. have any news. So Liz Parrish, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. What a great time. Yeah.